In part one of this documentary, we saw the rise of an abolition campaign that had used innovative strategies to force Parliament to consider a bill that would permanently end the trade of Africans across the Atlantic to the New World. However, the early momentum of the movement was halted abruptly in the early 1790s, and Wilberforce's first bill had failed to achieve a majority. Apart from the fierce opposition of wealthy planters, both within the metropole and in the colonies, what had changed to cause the campaign to lose its impetus? In France, a full-scale revolution had broken out. French citizens, fuelled by years of unrest and discontent over their king's economic and foreign policies, raised and redesigned their country's political landscape, uprooting centuries-old institutions, namely the absolute monarchy and the feudal system. The revolution that began in 1789, and that would last a decade, was characterised by extreme violence, mass riots and arson. King Louis XVI had fled Paris in 1791, yet he would eventually meet his death in the same city two years later by guillotine. On the other side of the Atlantic, another revolution had arisen in the form of a slave uprising in the French colony of Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue in the late 18th century was undoubtedly the most valuable European colony. It produced roughly 40% of the sugar and 60% of the coffee exported back to Europe. In order to reach these statistics, the colony saw an unprecedented scale of importation. Throughout the entire 17th and 18th century, Saint-Domingue imported close to 800,000 slaves, and in the immediate years leading up to the revolution, historians have calculated that roughly 40% of the entire transatlantic slave trade disembarked in the colony. The revolutionaries in France may have felt hard done by, and one would be naive to dismiss their cause for frustration. But if one was to compare their conditions to that endured by slaves in the French West Indies, well then, their problems would not have seemed so unbearable. This is because, in the colony of Saint-Domingue, one of the most unequal, violent and degrading systems of exploitation ever conceived existed. In the search for profit and extreme wealth, planters worked slaves to death, punishing those who could not keep up brutally with the whip. Men, women and children were forced to endure some of the most horrific conditions and were treated as nothing other than a commodity that provided labour. Mortality rates were high and exceeded birth rates, leading planters to require and purchase increasing numbers of slaves. The extraordinary influx of slaves after 1780 nevertheless took its toll on the stability of the colony. In August 1791, the colony's enslaved population took its stand against the horrific and oppressive institution. Under the heroic leadership of Toussaint Louverture, Hundreds of thousands of slaves and men of colour rose up and murdered and executed their white owners and planters. Despite colonists being overwhelmingly outnumbered, the revolution would last over 12 years, and while witnessing the death of hundreds of thousands of slaves, soldiers and colonists, it would eventually lead to the formation of the Republic of Haiti in 1804. The revolutions in both Saint-Domingue and France, along with the subsequent British involvement in the Revolutionary Wars, severely damaged the reputation of abolitionists and halted the momentum of the movement. With the government's attention now solely fixated on preparations for war, the movement was, as historian Robin Blackburn states, stopped in its tracks by an anti-Jacobin mobilisation, reinforced by the perceived necessities of imperial defence and competition. 
the abolition committee and all of its members fell victim to a counter-revolution in Britain that had arisen in opposition to the radical events occurring across both the Channel and the Atlantic and were all branded as unpatriotic Jacobins. Indeed, many in Britain had read and become influenced by the words of the highly respected political theorist Edmund Burke, who, in his Reflections on the Revolution in France, published in 1790, described the uprising as an utter disgrace and a blow aimed at the hand holding out graces, favours and immunities. The rebels and false patriots, harnessed by enlightened ideas and sentiment, had only seen laws overturned, tribunals subverted, industry without vigour, commerce expiring, people impoverished and a state not relieved. British statesmen may have claimed to dislike the slave trade, but in reality they were petrified of slaves. They often saw Africans as dangerous savages, and, especially in the political climate of the 1790s, these conservative men were inclined to agree with slaveholders. The abolition was not worth the risk that it might spark a revolt. Members of Parliament, wealthy, propertied Englishmen, see the upheaval in France, they see what's happened in the French slave colonies in places like Saint-Domingue, and their first instinct is not to do anything rash or risky, not to reform. And so this helps to make sure that the campaign for ending the slave trade goes quiet and doesn't get the reception that it might otherwise have had in Parliament for at least a decade. For the next 15 years, the disappointments were numerous and frequent. Between 1790 and 1805, the only success achieved by the campaign had been the passing of a renewed version of the 1788 Dolben Act roughly 10 years later, which had initially restricted the number of slaves that could be transported on British ships to the colonies. Nevertheless, it was clear that the campaign was in dire need of rejuvenation. But this was clearly a difficult task against such fierce opposition. The thing that really worries Parliament is the practical implications of abolition. Um, they're worried that this might undermine a, a central part of the British Empire, a central part of what makes the British Empire prosperous, and a central part of what makes Britain a great maritime nation. Remember that so much of that is dependent on its overseas trade. So they're keen to abolish on the grounds of religion and morality, but they are deterred because they're worried about, well, what might be the practical implications to us um, in terms of business, in terms of money, um, in terms of uh, an, a, a, our national interest of abolishing this trade. Pro-slavery lobbyists in abundance were quick to stress the economic importance of the Caribbean colonies to the empire and the dangers of abandoning the trade. The value of these colonies in their present state is no less a sum than 90 million pounds. We have a pretty sure prospect that upon abandoning it, France and Holland will enter the it's trade. One of those events which will more effectively assist Bonaparte in his projects of ambition against the British Empire. The trade evidently, according to pro-slavery lobbyists, had long supported the commercial greatness of Britain and had single-handedly developed ports such as Bristol, Glasgow and Liverpool. And so, throwing away lavishly the capital and revenues of this country, as Mr Wyndham exclaimed to the House of Commons, would be letting the Empire of Britain fall. And so, the campaign knew it had to make some adjustments. While it was almost universally acknowledged that the moral argument had already been won, both the profitability of the trade and the fear of revolution remained key impediments in the way of abolition. The lack of any substantial legislative reform in the 17 years since the committee had been established was telling and indicated that a different approach was needed. In order to implement a new strategy, however, 
abolitionists needed a stroke of luck. Ironically, this came with the death of Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger, who had been a close friend to Wilberforce and had openly advocated abolition in Parliament. Nevertheless, despite it being under his government that the question had been introduced, the unfinished abolition of the slave trade has been considered by biographers to have been his greatest failure. Pitt always claimed he wanted to see the abolition of the slave trade, but he never told his party and parliament how to vote on it. He always saw it as a question of conscience. And so the MPs who normally would support the government, his government as prime minister, were allowed their own freedom to vote as they wished on, on abolition bills. And it's partly that, I think, that helps to explain why abolition wasn't successful under Pitt. William Pitt, after having served as the youngest Prime Minister for 20 years, yet after having long suffered from ill health, eventually died in Putney and was buried here at Westminster Abbey on the 23rd of January, 1806. Still in a state of war with France, King George III asked the first cousin of the deceased Pitt, Lord William Grenville, to form a government of national unity. Essentially, a coalition government formed of three parties. It would become known as the Ministry of All Talents. The coalition ministry was dominated by those who supported abolition, not least its Prime Minister. William Grenville had long supported the ending of the trade. But he, along with other abolitionists, recognised that in order to pass a bill in Parliament, they had to promote it on the grounds that it supported national as well as colonial interest. Lord Grenville really lends heavy support to the cause of abolition as Prime Minister and even goes so far as to introduce the bill himself in the House of Lords. And uh, he recognises that the Lords had been a big stumbling block to passing abolition in the past. It was really in the Lords that the big abolition bills of the early 1790s were lost. Um, it's a much more conservative place um, than the House of Commons. And um, Prime Minister Grenville in 1807, as a member of the House of Lords, really puts his mark on the abolition bill um, by introducing it into the upper house, into the Lords, and making it very clear that he wants to see this legislation go through this time. Throughout the abolitionists' struggle to achieve reform, the revolution in Saint-Domingue had persisted into the 19th century and the death toll was increasing. Abolitionists had now long been stressing the danger of continuing the trade and the likelihood of an internal rebellion occurring in Britain's colonies, but often to no avail. Direct correlations had been drawn between the mass influx of slaves imported to the French colony in the years preceding the revolution, 215,000 of which were recorded to have arrived between 1780 and 1790 alone, and the uprising itself. Abolitionists get wise to parliamentary politics in the early 19th century, and circumstances also change in their favour. One of the things that abolitionists are able to do um, from 1802 onwards is make really strong arguments about Saint-Domingue and the revolution that's taken place in Saint-Domingue, the Haitian Revolution as it's often termed. Um, they make a really strong argument as to why that means that the British slave trade should be abolished. They claim that the revolution in, in Saint-Domingue was caused by the slave trade. They say so many newly arrived Africans create the circumstances for rebellion in that colony. Henry Brougham, a Scottish lawyer, co-founder of the Edinburgh Review magazine and later Lord Chancellor, published a pamphlet in which he warned of the dangers that a continual importation of slaves to the Caribbean might cause to the stability of Britain's West Indian colonies. In a concise statement of the question regarding the abolition of the slave trade, Broome stated, When the fire is raging to windward, as at the proper time for stirring up everything that is combustible in your warehouses, 
and throwing them new loads of material still more prone to explosion. A metaphorical insinuation that Jamaica might soon suffer from the same consequence as seen on its neighbouring island, the Scottish abolitionist asked, Does anyone imagine that the slaves of Jamaica are ignorant of the proud superiority of their free brethren on the opposite shore? Similar rhetoric was seen within the debates in Parliament, where the Foreign Secretary, Lord Howick, stated, It is most clearly established in evidence that the class of Negroes from which insurrection is to be feared consist of those recently imported from Africa, exposed to new injuries, still smarting under the wrongs they have been compelled to endure. Essentially, Howick claimed that those born into slavery had no concept nor any experience of freedom, and hence were less likely to challenge the institution. The words of both Brougham and Howick were emblematic of the new pragmatic argument that the trade threatened colonial and imperial security. It is also worth mentioning that these men were not only highlighting the danger of newly imported Africans as a revolutionary force, but they were also suggesting that locally born slaves, or Creoles as they were often referred to as, would make up a more manageable and sustainable workforce. With all being said, the fact of the matter was Britain now had no choice. It either immediately abolished its trade, in which case it could preserve its colony and the profitable institution of slavery, or it didn't, in which case it would inevitably witness the loss of its most lucrative colonial asset forever. But this seems to beg the question, what made this rhetoric any different to that which had been expressed by abolitionists when the uprising had begun in 1791? Why were arguments that warned of a rebellion then now not considered to be unpatriotic? The answer was that man up there, Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1799, the military leader had organised a coup and had seized political power in the new French Republic as first consul. While the constitution preserved the appearance of a republic, in reality it had established a dictatorship. It wasn't long before Napoleon soon crowned himself the Emperor of France in 1804. Under his leadership, Napoleon sought to expand the French Empire and one of his first priorities was to reinstate slavery in the former French colony of Saint-Domingue. In 1801, Napoleon sent an impressive expedition to reassert control over the colony. After initial victories and the capture of the rebel commander Toussaint Louverture, the war soon became a bloody struggle of atrocity and attrition. The rainy season had brought yellow fever and malaria, taking a heavy toll on the invaders. By November 1802, 24,000 French soldiers were already dead, including their commander, General Leclerc. British troops were also sent to aid the rebels in their attempts to drive the French out. After a bloody conflict that would lead to the death of over 200,000 rebels, 25,000 white colonists and over 120,000 French and British troops combined, Napoleon's task force was eventually defeated and on the 1st of January 1804, the rebel commander Jean-Jacques Dessalines officially declared the former colony's independence, renaming it the Republic of Haiti after its indigenous Arawak name. Napoleon's defeat and the formation of Haiti proved to be an extremely significant moment in the timeline of abolition. Ending the slave trade in light of Britain's declaration of war against France could now be seen as a patriotic act and one that would not lead to the ruin of the British white colonists. <laughs> 
made sufficiently aware of the significant threats posed to colonial security by continued importation, MPs were also secure in the knowledge that British planters faced easier market conditions without any competition, and hence, those who had previously voted down abolition bills were now in favour of them. I think by the early 19th century, particularly after Napoleon tries to reinstate slavery across the French Empire, after that period it does become more easy to put abolitionism with patriotism and say to be an abolitionist is also to be a patriot because look, it's very different to what the French are doing. James Stevens' Foreign Slave Trade Act was one such bill that received the backing of many MPs who had previously opposed any legislation. The act banned the importation by British traders of slaves into territories belonging to foreign powers and pragmatically had linked abolition and patriotism in a time of war. Eventually passed by Parliament in 1806, it was the first piece of substantial legislative reform that had been achieved by the abolition campaign in over a decade and effectively had cut off two-thirds of the British slave trade without anyone realising it. Stephen, in a tactful manner, had therefore effectively created an ideal environment in which an abolition bill that would end the entire trade could realistically be passed in Parliament. The British abolish the, the slave trade in British ships to foreign colonies before they abolish the slave trade to British colonies. And that actually wipes out a big chunk of the slave trade um, before 1807. And it's very easy to present that foreign slave trade bill as a patriotic bill, because of course trading in enslaved Africans, trafficking those children, women and men across the Atlantic to work on the colonies of uh, your uh, your rivals of, of other, other countries, you can present that as being um, unpatriotic. The Foreign Slave Trade Act had paved the way for abolition to occur. Clearly as a result of the new pragmatic approach, abolitionists were able to transform their agenda into a legislative reality. Less than one year later, the Slave Trade Act was passed in government and given royal assent on the 25th of March, 1807. Historian Philip Morgan once suggested that should the question of abolition have been put to a referendum, it perhaps may have been abolished as early as 1788. There can be no doubt that the work of men like Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce lay at the foundation of the abolitionist movement and helped to force Parliament through an impressive and innovative campaign to consider abolishing a trade that was extremely lucrative to Britain and her empire. One of the things that we see with the abolition movement, of course, is one of the first uh, examples of pressure group politics and a really successful group that has its own logo um, that tries to influence Parliament not by backdoors lobbying, um, talking to individual MPs, but by taking a case to the nation and getting public opinion on its side um, and using that as a way to try to put pressure on Parliament um, to, to pass a substantial piece of legislation. Nevertheless, throughout this documentary, we have explored how legislative reform depended on a new pragmatic approach, alongside influential external factors and events. While the death of William Pitt had allowed for a ministry committed to ending the trade replace his government, the rebellion in Saint-Domingue and Napoleon's failure to recapture the colony created the opportunity for abolitionists to implement their new pragmatic approach end the trade on our terms, they argued, and we can retain our lucrative colonial asset without the fear of being outcompeted or a full-scale rebellion. The abolition of the slave trade was a monumental event in British history. It was an event that split party lines, political relationships, personal friendships, and divided well-respected public figures.
While some 18th and 19th century imperial heroes and famous authors openly advocated slavery and racial inequality, others stood firmly against it. Accusations of hypocrisy and duplicity were widespread within a debate that involved issues that still remain at the heart of the current political climate, those being security, the nation's economy, morality and principle. In the end it seems that while many MPs debating abolition claim to be acting out of deeply held moral ideas, the discussion was only decided when abolition could be shown to serve the national interest. Perhaps abolition was not such a special case after all.